Good morning. Uh, as we uh, have spent the last few days getting down to the 53 plus uh, 17, um, just want to start off by saying, you know, really excited about where we are going this season. Um, and, you know, this process has been rigorous. I want to thank a lot of people involved. My personnel staff, my executive staff, uh, they do an incredible job. Our pro group led by Sam DeLuca. Uh, just a lot of people work tirelessly to get to this point in the process. Our coaching staff, uh, we meet frequently um, to, to get information, update about our team. Um, as I said when I first got here, the best thing you can do is know what you have inside this building. And a lot of that comes from our dialogue and, and discussions with our coaches um, as, and a personnel staff together. Um, just really appreciative of everybody who spends a lot of time and they've yeah. earned a, a Labor Day weekend, uh, to be sure. Um, you know, you know. I think at this point, um, you know, we should be focused, uh, go, go, focus more towards next season, uh, this season, excuse me, um, what the 2024 Vikings look like. Um, looking at the roster, really excited to, at where it's at. Uh, Kevin's done a great job with training camp, physical, competitive, um, really getting us, allowing us to see what this team can look like this year. And we're excited about where we are, um, and we'll go from there. That I'll take questions. Quasi, we've talked a lot about timelines and things like that with you uh, in the past. Uh, I guess, where, where do you see this roster with you know, some of the veterans you brought in, but also unproven players that you're hoping will step up this year? Yeah, I think that's the, the perfect way to think about it. It's, it's a collection of players, people, different points in their career, and you're trying to hit that magical, you know, craps role where a lot of things happen together at once. Um, and, and so, you know, with your veteran players, they're going to be a little bit more known what they are, their play histories, things like that. And young players have a little bit more of an unknown. Um, and so when you're, when you're putting together a team, you don't know from the five, six, seven, whatever young players there are, who of those two or three are going to step forward, but you're counting on two or three of those people to step forward. So just kind of looking at it collectively um, in that way. When, it, when I go through this season, I, you know, you do projections, but you're just projecting at what could happen. You know, here are the things that we think need to happen for us to be one of those last teams standing and, and doing that in a, in a really thoughtful and constructive way. What does need to happen? Uh, I think, you know, there's certain players, you know, have you ever, you looked at win totals uh, in, a, in an NFL season, you know, you know how they do that? Have you ever, oh, yeah. what's your, yeah, yeah, yeah how, how, would you, how would you do it? How would you come up with that? Boy, I have no idea. So the one way to do it, right, you could you could build a Monte Carlo simulation, right? These are things where you can kind of go through and on a player level look at a single player and say, hey, how good is this player going to be this season? And that's based on a lot of different factors, how good they were in the past, injury history, wh what point in their career do they start hitting that growth curve, right, things like that. And you hold that constant. Oh, sorry, you, you hold everybody else constant, and then you kind of change that player. Now you have to do that with all 53 players, simulate injury luck, different things like that. Now am I doing that these days? No, I'm not. But am I going through and saying, hey, big picture, what are the th key things that we need to happen to, to have this team be one of those good uh, teams that I want to be? And I've kind of identified, identified those things. And you want to make sure you're not hoping. Or can these things actually happen in realistic ability? And I think given the players we brought in, the, the scheme, the fit, all those different things, where they are in their careers, the character, what I've seen in them, we have a really great chance to, for those things to happen. I don't want to say them specifically uh, to you, if you can understand, just, uh, you know, I want to put undue pressure on certain people, but uh, we just believe in this team. I believe in Coach and the way he's uh, handling this business, and we're excited about the season. Quasi, whether it's trading Andrew Booth or cutting Louis Sr. and moving on from the top two guys you took in that first draft, what goes into that process for you in trying to decide when to move on from guys you picked? Yeah, I think when you, when you when you look at decisions, you you try and break them into outcomes. What happened? Bad outcomes, good outcomes, whatever they are. And bad outcomes can happen from a lot of things: bad decision making, bad process, bad information, bad implementation when they get here, bad support. There's a lot of different ways that that, that can go a certain way. So you're always w real time trying to evaluate how you're doing it as an organization, uh, not just for the good of the organization, but the good of the person. Um, and I think at times you get to a place where you decide where the, that roster spot, that, that, that value received is better used elsewhere. And it also might be better for that player. Um, when we bring these players in, we talk about people um, and this culture being important to us. And it's not just about what's great for us, it's what's great for them. And if it gets to a place where from both sides you decide it's best if you part ways, I think that's when you do it. And ultimately I, I have undue respect and admiration for those guys for what they've meant to the Vikings to this point. They wanted nothing more than to be great Minnesota Vikings. And life doesn't always work out the way you want it to. And sometimes for life's benefit it doesn't. Uh, but I will always uh, be supportive of them. Uh, my relations were not transactional with these players. They have my number forever. Um, and I wish them the best. I can imagine a compete of... factor in your, you know, when you, when you come up with your formula, compete factor and selfish versus unselfish. How, how does that factor in when guys are different stages of contracts, 
you know, all of a sudden the season starts going south, some are injured longer. How do you measure that? That's a great question. We can't. Uh, we kind of just leave it in this little term that we can't. And that's ultimately, you can project and do all these fancy things you want to do, but there's you can't predict with certainty for all those things you talk about. It's not just player level, it's how they come together, that vibes teams can have, culture, chemistry, all those different things matter. Those are things we cannot project, but you can sort of have a baseline for where you think your team can be based on performance, but that's a phenomenal question. Those are things I can't you know, say, uh, say with certainty, but I am very confident in coach and how he's built this group and how, we, how we, can, we can really have that conversation about, hey, this room, how that room looks and how those leaders are picking up those young players. And those are things I've had to grow and learn with in, in this job myself. Um, and I think we have, we're in a great spot with that. What will you take away from the decisions that were made and the execution of the, the top of that 2022 draft with not only Lewis, but also Andrew Green? Yeah, you know, not related to those players in specific, uh, but I, I, I thought a lot about those days and competing trying to compete on multiple timelines and different things like that. Um, I had a conversation with Kev, uh, this is probably a year ago or something around then, and I asked him, you know, one time, you know, what was it like when we were down 33 nothing? You know, when you feel like you're down, you know, when I entered the building, you know, trying to compete, aging roster, salary cap stuff, I think there was times where I felt down 33 nothing. Um, and as we all know, that game, it starts with one play, one drive and you build. And I think at times I might have been guilty of trying uh, to maybe have a 33-point play all at once. Um, and I think, you know, once I identified that, I kind of really just, and I think if, if you've seen from, since then, it's been really foundationally just taking good steps, building to a certain critical point where I think we can compete over the long term. So what do you mean, the 33-point play by trading downs? Just all of it together. I, I would say just, you know, a lot of times I think you know, you can be creative enough to think of your issues, but that can be a bad thing, right? Other to sometimes it might be just blind to say, let's just put one foot in front of the other and make, you know, just make one decision after the other. And I'm not going to say specifically related to that, but just big picture, if I can look holistically at that decision, that's something I've thought through. Where, where do you think that left um, the organization or like in terms of was it a setback that you had to overcome? with free agency or like what do you think the impact of the way that's worked out will be? I mean, ultimately, after you make a decision, you, you're always looking at the roster, the state of the roster, where it is. So you don't look at necessarily how you got there. You kind of see where we're at, where, where can these players go, and then you just respond from there. So I can't say specifically how I've you know, responded to, to, those, to, that, to that decision, mm -hmm. but you just look at the roster from that standpoint and how do we, again, always put together that, that, that timeline, that group of players that can potentially compete for a good championship. And we've tried to do that, um, not necessarily focusing specifically on how we, we filled in those gaps. There's been a lot of setbacks this summer yet. Um, what have you applied kind of from your philosophies and even what you've learned in two years to sort of make sure you guys respond and sort of pivot effectively from some of these Setbacks. Yeah, you know, I, I got to say, I've learned a lot in this job, but how I respond to setbacks and adversity, that, that, that comes from my parents, you know, seeing a, a mom uh, who just every time something happened, she just looked at me and say, I'm just going to wake up and work. Uh, so that's where I get that from, uh, my resolve and all the people that I appreciate in my life who've been there for me in that, that way. Um, and Kevin's wired the same exact way. Um, just patient, calm. Well, how do we make first? How do we care about people? And then second, how do we make sound, rational decisions? That's just how we're wired. Um, that's kind of how we want to be as leaders, and that's how we'll continue to be. In terms of the DBs and depth, with that said, you kind of were in a triage situation this whole summer. How do you evaluate how you guys handled that? You know, you know, I think we, we decided where we. We like how we played defense last year, but we wanted to give ourselves the flexibility to be, be a little bit more you know, versatile, maybe play a little bit more man coverage defense. So we went out, decided to figure out how to give ourselves the ability to do that, loving the people we had in the building, but also trying to give ourselves other options. And I think we've done that. Um, with an eye to today, but also the future. We love keeping uh, Dwight McLaughlin, who we think is a really, uh, potentially a really good player. Um, we have Makai Blackman, who I just got to see, you know, first time since uh, since his, his injury coming back next year. Um, we have a Caleb, we have different players that we think, and we love that they're in, in a room with Stephon Gilmore and a Byron Murphy to learn from and th different things like that. So, you know, I'm never going to stand up here and say we handled something good or definitely not going to say good. That's probably not really my, my way. Uh, but, um, you know, responded and we feel good about um, the direction that group is headed. Is the practice squad different now? You know, when you, for a while there, those were always just rookies, and now there's so many veterans on it. How do you view that as an asset, as, a, as you sign guys? You know, you know how, how, what's the practice squad mean to you? No, that's an incredible question. I was talking with uh, Ryan Grigson uh, yesterday about that. Uh, not just veterans, but just, you know, the, the world really is this way. We're just, there's patience isn't 
a, a thing anymore, right? You know, we get information like that, and, and the world has just kind of gone to that place. And with players, the, the phrase draft and develop and all these development rule, words you get you used to be used, even at the collegiate level, right? You, you, you recruit a 17-year-old kid, you, it's not working, you go to the portal. Um, and so the world is kind of shifting towards that place. So how do we navigate that? And I don't say that as a, uh, as a complaint. Anytime there's a challenge to overcome, that's an opportunity for us to, to be better than other people. So really trying to think thoughtfully about what that means. Um, where it, I think it, will, it should impact your draft strategy. To be, to be frank, I think it's something you should consider in your draft strategy, but also knowing that those that's a different channel to, to talent acquisition. You should be very mindful of that in your preseason evaluations, tying together with your college evaluations, knowing that, hey, there's this practice squad with really good players on it. You can keep veterans. There also could be other teams, young players on it, in addition to my the young players on this team. So it's a lot to think about. It's a great question. We're always going to keep thinking about those things. How do we be a little bit better on the margins uh, relative to those challenges? With that said, are you going to try to bring back Jaron Hall? Yes, yes, we would try and bring back, bring back Jaron. Yeah. What were you trying to accomplish with that? Yeah, yeah, I, I think Jaron's done a great job for us. Obviously, he had a, he really improved over the preseason. We talk. I use that development word a lot, you know. And, and with quarterbacks, you don't want to throw these guys in um, too early. And I think. Um, you know, with him, we just want more time to work pouring to him. That's, that's really what it is. And I've learned from last season that you're either one snap away or you're one snap from being one snap away. Um, and we just wanted to be in a position where uh, we felt, you know, adding Brett to the room feels, you know, feels good. We feel good about that decision, but also giving us more time uh, to pour into Jaron and, and work with him if he so chooses to do that. Quincy, with the 22 draft, and you mentioned outcomes, like how do you balance – Evolving your process with just the uncertainty that is the draft. Yep. Yeah, I think you, that's what you have to compare it to some baseline, right? And if there's some average, even if you look back at that draft, some average hit rate from different parts of the draft or even over a five-year time horizon, you try and look at it that way. The only thing I do know is you never want to do it in a way that's self, self-fulfilling, right? I never want to look at it in a way, and how do I find a way to make myself feel better? That's how you don't grow. That's how you don't get better. So we will never do that in this building, uh, but we'll try to be thoughtful about it, trying to find ways to improve, but also not overweight on one decision, which, you know, obviously there could be chance. There could be things like that. That, but always making sure you try and figure out there were there things that within our control. That's why I get to stand up here because all the different things that go into a bet, good outcome, bad outcome, it's a one-stop shop. They fall at my feet, so I got to figure out how to do it in, in the best way possible. Did that change your thoughts too on on going back in the draft to try to get picks? Because I, I mean, certainly in this draft, you moved up twice. Yeah. Um, have, have you? Did that help shape the philosophy that you use now as opposed to twenty? I would say that everything that uh, you know I, I do in the past has some re 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 relevance to what I've done. The, the sorry, what I've done do in the future has some relevance to what I've done in the past. Um, you know, these are things I've thought about for a long period of time. I wouldn't say specifically to that trade, but also just more, what types of decisions do you need to make? And then, hey, if you don't have as many picks, where can you go get those similar players? You talked about a practice squad. There's other teams, few, former third, fourth round picks around different practice squads, and that's an avenue channel and different things like that. So just trying to be thoughtful about those different things. But yeah, that's a great question. Quincy, what is the plan of kick returner? Yeah, right now uh, it would be Miles Gaskin, uh, but you could speak more with uh, with Hat about that. Um, really, really um, excited about what he did this training camp. Came back um, in incredible shape. You know, Kevin and I have the glass windows where we can kind of look out on the field, and you see a guy after game day doing all kinds of drills, just deciding for himself, I want to be the best version of myself for this team. Had a great camp, um, won the job, and, and we're excited to, to, to what he's bringing. Quincy, what happened with, uh, with Kane? I had a good preseason. Yeah. You didn't even try him at kick return. Yeah. What went into all that? Yeah, it was more about Miles. Uh, Kene uh, was a, has been a good player for this organization uh, since he's been drafted. Great person. Um, we just want to. I just want to make it more about Miles. Miles just has a really diverse skill set to help us on special teams and offense. Kene is a really talented player, uh, a kick returner in this league at a high level for a long period of time. We just thought that for pure true uh, for roster value, we thought that Miles was just a better decision. What's, what stood out about the way Kevin has led through the past two months? Yeah, I, I would say it's just that that steady demeanor that we, we all know he has. Um, it's it's and it's it's an accountable demeanor. It's it's always just trying to figure out, you know, first and foremost, how do we how do we make sure pe people people matter, and then also, okay, how do I figure out how to get better? 
and, 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 and help this organization. It's never looking to point blame, never once. It's just not how he's wired. Um, it's just how do we go forward? How do we be calm and make rational decisions? Um, those are things that, again, I, I identified in him in that first boardroom interview and from all the reference work, so I'm not surprised that that's how he is. But it is good to see when those moments happen that he is the person you thought he was. Are you expecting um, Hawkinson to be ready after the four weeks? You know, he's he, again those big windows. I get to see a lot. Uh, he's out there running choice routes. He looks like he could he could go uh, tomorrow. Um, but I think you know, in the past, maybe that's something that would be a, more of a given, given how he looks. But we'll continue to re uh, re uh, consult with doctors. Um, there's a lot of good evidence that suggests certain timelines are better for re-injury re risk going forward, and we'll we'll follow those. Has a JJ's injury change, excuse me, if at all, the sort of the longer term planning for? I don't know that the injury changed longer term planning, uh, to be honest. I think I think Kev had maybe mentioned just in a short time he had, he had identified himself as somebody we want to, you know, I don't use the terms everybody else was, but hitch our wagon to, right? A, a guy that when I look back on my career that I decided to go chase it with a bunch of times, I'd, I'd be happy if it was JJ McCarthy. Um, and so that was a great, great thing to really realize. Um, so I don't know that it changed our long-term planning any other way because that, that's something we actually thought from our evaluations and the, the character reports and all those things we thought we were getting into the building. He's been everything we thought he was and more. Um, but I also don't want to not say you know good things about Sam Darnold because I think he's been really good for this team, um, talented, um, came in right away. And you know his teammates, the football players are evaluators too. They know very quickly um, whether guys can play, and that's an important thing. Um, and they, they knew very quickly how talented he was how relatable he is to his teammates, the, the leadership, all that stuff. Um, so we're excited about Sam. When you asked Kevin about how we dealt with it when he was down 33-0, um, now that you take things piecemeal, how do you balance that, though, with the culture of the NFL that what have you done for me lately? And, you know, that, that's an internal struggle sometimes. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's fair, and that's, that's, that, that should be the NFL, right? It's the most competitive, only 32 teams, and we're all trying to compete for the same thing to be the last team standing. Um, but it is a delicate balance. Uh, each, now, each, step, each move you take step by step to get to that end goal, Within that move is our, there's kind of both timelines kind of embedded in it, but what you don't want to do is try and solve all of the all of the issues at once, right? So I think it's 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 you still want to have long and short term horizons when you make decisions, but you just don't want to be in a rush to kind of get to that end goal. You just really want to be uh, kind of deliberate in in, in, in in your process, and we, we've done a really good job doing that. And I'm not saying that that was the sole you know, 2022 draft, but that's something that I've kind of just been self-scouting and reporting in my own reflections about um, just my want and eagerness to bring you know to this team what they, they all want to they all want to see in the city. Um, and so, but I think it's in a great place right now, um, and we're excited about this season. What's your confidence level in Ed Ingram? Um, you know, Ed, Ed, Ed has been uh, a solid player for us. Obviously, uh, he started. I think he came back from his injury um, in, a, in a certain place where he, you know, wasn't fully ready. So camp was a slow start for him. But he's kind of ascended uh, since then. Um, you know, this th that sport. You know, we, we in my personal group we talk about counting balls and strikes. Right? It's a consistency position. Um, they only see your. They only call the O line's name when something bad happens. Right? So you want to be at a place where you're consistent for your teammates and showing up. Uh, different things like that, and we, we expect that from Ed. Um, we'll be mindful of that, but you know, I, I love his character. I know he was here working hard this off season. Um, we're going to keep giving Ed chances uh, to be the Ed we want him to be because he sets a tone in the run game. He's somebody we want on the field for us. I'm excited to see how he comes out this season.